Hey everyone, Kevin here, and this is part 4 in my modding Minecraft 1.8 with Forge series. Uh, in this video, I was going to do a remake of the Monkey Mob. Uh, the problem is that my original MCP Monkey Mob project, the banana items were dropping from jungle tree leaves, when in reality, bananas grow on banana plants. So I decided to create a growable, pickable banana plant, which also gives us the opportunity to learn something new. So in this tutorial, I'd like to cover a different type of block I used for the banana plant, the tile entity. The tile entity is a cross between a normal block and an entity. Why use them? Well, you get the best of both worlds. Blocks on their own are for the most part static. There is no real dynamic interactivity, and the block class only supports 16 states, which is not enough in some cases. Blocks are only updated when the block itself or one of its neighbors are changed. Entities, on the other hand, are dynamic, interactive, and come with a full update event called on each tick, and the ability to store unlimited amounts of data for each instance. We can also disable the standard block renderer and associate a custom renderer to the tile entity, allowing us to create complex models the same way you would with an entity using technique. Blocks like the signs, chests, droppers, pistons, and most other interactive blocks are all tile entities. The only drawback with tile entities is that they can slow down performance if you have a lot of them loaded at once, especially if there's a lot of computations going on in the update event. So how do they work? Well, first you create a block like any other block and implement the iTile entity provider in the block class. Then you create a tile entity class extended from tile entity. In the block class, you specify which tile entity to use with the create new tile entity event function inherited by the iTile entity provider class. The final step is to register the block and the tile entity in the common proxy init function. When an instance of the block is created, the create new tile entity function is called and a tile entity is created at the same location as the block. The tile entity is actually a standalone object that only exists in memory at the same virtual location as the block who created it. When the block is destroyed or changed to another block, the tile entity associated with it is also destroyed automatically. So what exactly are we doing? Well, it's a plantable, growable, and pickable banana plant. The complete plant took a lot of planning, so let me show you what the finished plant looks like, then I'll show you how I made it. My banana plant has an age range of 0 to 7 stages. This is the first stage, age zero. This is age one, which is two blocks high. This is age two. Age two to age seven are all four blocks high. Age three. Age 4, age 5, the bananas start to sprout, age 6, they get a little larger, and at age 7, the bananas are ripe. You can now right click on the banana block to drop a random number of bananas between 1 and 5. The plant reverts back to age 4. Breaking the plant will always drop a banana plant sprout, and if the plant is age 7, bananas will also drop. Okay, so now the details. The plant is made of two types of blocks. There's the bottom block, which is the root block, also referred to as the tier 1 block. The root block is the one that gets picked up and placed. It can only be placed on grass and dirt. The second block is the sections block. It can only be placed on the root block or on itself. The sections block makes up the blocks that are not the root block, from tier 2 to 4. Both types of blocks use the same tile entity class and renderer. I started with creating an image for each stage of the plant growth.
Then I started creating a model in Techni for each age of the plant. Let's put a non-transparent texture so you can see what the model actually looks like. It's very important that the position of the pivot for each cube in the model are all set to 0, 24, 0. So they all line up properly when coded into Minecraft. Ages 0, 1, and 2 have different models. But ages 3 to 7 all use the same model with different textures. Again, this is what the age 3 to 7 model looks like without transparency. These are the textures I created as I modeled each plant age. I was going to import these models directly into Minecraft as they were when I realized something important. Hitboxes in Minecraft can't be larger than a standard block. So you can't create a model larger than a standard block with a hitbox that covers the entire model. Besides, this model would require several hitboxes of different sizes to work properly. Instead, I broke the models into multiple blocks for each age. Age 7, for example, is made of these four blocks. The top block model that makes up the leaves is much larger than a standard block, but the hitbox only needs to be the same size as a full block. So the next step was to break each plant model into multiple blocks. I organized them into these folders for each age. Age 0 is made up of only one root block. Age 1 is made up of two blocks, a tier 1 root block and a sections block. This is the root block. And this is the model for the tier 2 sections block. Age 2 is made up of 4 blocks, a tier 1 root block and 3 section blocks. This is the tier 2 sections block. The tier 3 sections block. and the tier 4 sections block.
And finally, ages three to seven all use the same model, made of four blocks, a root and three sections. The leaves are obviously larger than a block, but as I said, the hitbox doesn't need to be that big. The only thing to remember is that a standard block size is 16 by 16 by 16 units in technique. Now, be aware that this project will have several classes that work together, so there will be a lot of switching back and forth between classes. I'll do my best to explain the details along the way, but if you have a hard time following along, the source code and assets are available for download in the description. And it might be easier to follow along if you're examining the code while watching the video. The goal here is not to just give you a bunch of code that adds up to a tile entity, but for you to learn how to code a tile entity for yourself. Okay, so I'll show you how to create the most basic tile entity. All tile entities must have at least these elements. So create a new class in your package. This is my banana plant root block class. So I'll call it block banana plant root. We extend it from the block class. And for this block to have a tile entity attached to it, we need to implement the I tile entity provider class. I tile entity provider and block classes also need to be added to the imports. The next step is to create a constructor as usual. And a block extended class constructor must always call the parent block constructor, which requires a material as its parameter. For these blocks, I'll use the leaf material. It comes with the leaf breaking sound, and the leaves material has many of the properties I want for the banana plant. This has tile entity function returns whether this class should be treated as though it has a tile entity attached to it. We set it to return true. Now let's quickly create a tile entity class to assign to this block. Create a new class and call it tile entity banana plant. We extend it from the tile entity class and add tile entity to the imports. Then we can save this class and go back to the block class. Now we can assign the tile entity class to this block with the create new tile entity function. We set it to return a new tile entity banana plant. We also need to add the world and tile entity classes to the imports. Now save, and let's move on to the section class. Create a new class and call it block banana plant section. Again, we extend from the block class and implement the iTile entity provider. We add a constructor. And we can simply copy and paste the two tile entity functions from the root block we just created and paste it in the section block class.
then save the changes. Also remember to add the imports for the block and iTile entity provider. Now a little side note. In the Tile Entity class, if you want an update event for each tick, you can implement the IUpdatePlayerListBox class. This will give you access to an update event function that will be called on every tick. However, keep in mind that this will have an impact on performance, so don't use it unless you really need an update event in your Tile Entity. The banana plant won't need it, so I won't be using it in this tutorial. Now the beauty of tile entities is that you can save unlimited amounts of data for each one. So what do we want to save in this one? Well, the plant's age and the tier of the block that this tile entity is attached to. So we create two private integer variables, plant age and plant tier and we initialize plant tier to a default of one. So how do we save this data? Well, there are two functions that come with all entities, the write to NBT and read from NBT. These two functions are used to write and read data from the world chunk save file. These functions are periodically called automatically when chunks are saved. But we need to save when these variables are changed. Well, for that, you need to call two special functions that mark the chunk as needing to be saved. And they will get saved on the next tick. So let's create a new function called mark for update. And in that function, we call the world object mark block for update and mark dirty. The mark block for update is used to tell the server that it's time to send the client an updated copy of this object. And mark dirty marks this entity as needing to be saved. Now we create public set and get functions for the age and tier variables. In the set functions, after we set the variables, we call the mark for update function we created above. I also added a set function to set both age and tier at the same time. This can render breaking needs to return true if you want the cracks overlay to appear on the tile entity when you're breaking it. Now there's only one last thing to add to the tile entity. Tile entities run almost entirely server side and all the custom variables that we add are not automatically updated on the client. This means that when we change a value, like the age for example, the change is only made on the server, not the client. So if we change the age variable, the client won't know it. So how do we get the server to update that value on the client? Well, we have to set up a packet send and receive. The mark block for update function will tell the server to send the new value to the client when it's changed. But we need to create two functions in this class to tell it what data to send and how to process the received data. The first function is the get description packet. Make sure to add the packet class to the imports. This function writes the save file, then creates a packet of type packet update tile entity and attaches the save data to it, which is the age and tier, then returns the packet. This is what gets sent to the client when the mark block for update is called. The next function is the onDataPacket function. 
This is the event called when the client receives the update packet from the server. We call the read from NBT function on the packet data, which loads the contents of the packet into the local client variables. And we're all done with the tile entity. You can save and close. Now back to the banana plant root block. We're going to concentrate on the root block for now. Let's add the list of variables for this class. Fruit will contain the fruit item that drops and gets picked up from this plant. Fruit fall height holds the height that the fruit drops from. From the banana plant, this will be 3. So the bananas will spawn at the height of the tier 3 block. Fruit min and max amount holds how many fruits can drop. Minimum light level to grow is the minimum amount of light required for the plant to age up. Light levels in full sunlight is usually around 15, and light levels at night are usually around 7 to 9. The grow chance percentage will be used to calculate the chance that the plant has of aging up on each random tick interval. Update tick interval is the average game ticks between each block tick. The spawn child chance percentage is the chance that a fully grown plant has of spawning a child near it. And the spawn child max distance is the minimum distance that a child can spawn from its parent. And item needs to be added to the imports. Now let's add all the parameters we need for the constructor. Here's a list of all the parameters. Plant hardness and resistance are standard block variables. Hardness defines how many hits it takes to break the block, and resistance sets the block's resistance to explosions. The min and max gen height sets the minimum and maximum altitude that this plant can be generated. Max gen amount per chunk is the maximum number of plants that can generate in each chunk. And gen chance percentage is the chance that each of the plants will actually spawn at that location. And finally, a biome gen base array to define a list of biomes that this plant can generate in. The biome gen base class needs to be added to the imports. Okay, now we can start building the constructor for this block. Right after the parent call, we need to insert these two lines. This is block container must be set to true if this block contains a tile entity. And we set set tick randomly to true. This sets the block's update event to random intervals. We do this so we can simulate random growth intervals, because no two plants should grow at the exact same rate. Now on the bottom of the class, we're going to add the two harvest enumerators I created in the custom block tutorial. I always place these in my block classes to make setting the harvest level and tool easier. And of course, we also need the custom set harvest level function that accompanies them.
Now back to the constructor. We can start adding all the usual block settings. This block's unlocalized name, its hardness value, resistance, step sound, which we set to type grass, the creative tab, which we set to the decorations tab, and we need to add the creative tabs class to the imports. And we use our custom set harvest level function to set this block to be harvested by a wood axe. The harvest function will be overridden for this block. So the only thing this line does is sets the tool that will break the block most efficiently. Then we can assign all the values to the variables for this class. We then make a call to the game registries register block function and pass this as the block and the name of the banana plant. And we can also register the tile entity here with the block using register tile entity function. The parameters are the tile entity class and a name. And finally, at the top of the constructor, I added a set fire info. This function in the block fire class registers this block as flammable. The parameters for this function are the block, which is this, and two integers, which represent how flammable the block is and how fast it burns away. Now we can start building the body of the plant block class. The first function is the register renderer. This will register the renderer for the block item that drops when you break the block. The tick rate function sets the average intervals between each tick of the update event. This can harvest block returns whether this block drops an item when broken. We return false here because I don't want to use the built-in drop event for this block. Because breaking any one of the plant blocks will break the entire plant, and using the built-in drop events will only confuse things. We'll be controlling the drops manually in another way. The drop block item with chance event function also needs to be overridden. And the get item dropped as well should return null. This can place block on returns whether the specified block is a dirt or grass block. This can place block at is inherited from the block class and returns whether this block can be placed at the specified location. We set it to return the parent can place block at and the can place block on function we just created, passing in the block directly under the specified position as the parameter. This can stay function returns whether this block can stay at the current location. This function will be used in block updates to determine if the current location is still valid. This drop plant items is our custom item drop function. This first line spawns the plant block as an item. No matter what breaks the plant, the plant will always drop a root to be replanted. 
Now we need to access the tile entity attached to this block to retrieve the age variable. To access a tile entity, we make a call to the world object's get tile entity function and pass it the position of the entity, which is the same position as the block. This will return a tile entity, which we cast to type tile entity banana plant and store it in a variable called banana plant. If there's no tile entity found, or the tile entity found is not of the type we casted it to, banana plant will be null. So we make a check after every get tile entity call to make sure that we have indeed retrieved a tile entity of the expected type. Now that we have the tile entity for this block, we can check if the age of the plant is 7, which is the only age that the bananas can drop. If so, we get a random amount between fruit min amount and fruit max amount, then spawn the bananas at the position of the plant plus the fruit fall height, which in this case is the third block up. The set block bounds based on state is another inherited function called each tick. We use it to set the bounding box of the block depending on its age. Is replaceable sets whether this block can be replaced by another block being placed on it. We set this to return false. Is opaque cube returns whether light can pass through this block. This needs to be set to false because the stem of the plant is not a full cube, and it would look strange if it blocked light like a full block. Is full cube returns false as well. We also override unblock harvested and harvest block because we'll be controlling the drops for this block ourselves. Here I override the on block placed by and call the parent. I did this because I might want to add some other functionality here later. Since we're using a custom renderer with this tile entity, we want to disable the block standard rendering system. Get render type returning negative one is how this is accomplished. Since the banana plant sections block is an extended part of the banana plant, we're going to declare and initialize the banana plant sections block here in the banana plant root block. Now let's save this class and move on to creating a basic renderer class for our tile entity. Create a new class and call it Tile Entity Banana Plant Renderer. We start by extending this class from the Tile Entity Special Renderer class. We then create a constructor. And the only required function is this render tile entity at. You can now save this and we can go back to the banana plant root block class and register the renderer for the tile entity. In the constructor, right after the block registry, 
we register the renderer to the tile entity using the client registry's bind tile entity special renderer function. Now to complete the root block class, we need to open the sections block class and add the parameters to the constructor. So open the block banana plant sections class. We start by adding the required variables. Here we have a few familiar variables. The block banana plant root variable will contain a reference to the root block to make accessing its methods and fields easier. And here's the list of parameters we need in the constructor. Again, we set the fire stats, is block container to true, and random ticks to true. And we add the custom set harvest level function. The usual block properties in the constructor and we assign the parameters to the class variables. And finally, we register this block as banana plant section. Now we can save this and go back to the root banana plant block class to finish up. In the constructor of the block banana plant root class, we can initialize the section block variable. And now we can finish up the root block. This can grow through returns whether the specified block is a banana plant section or an air block.
this has room for age function will return whether or not there's enough room above the plant for the specified age. At age 0, we always return true. At age 1, we return true if there's an air or section block one block above the root. And at age 2 or higher, we return true only if there's air or section blocks for the three blocks above the root. The kill plant function does just that. We call this function when one of the sections or root block has been broken to destroy the entire plant. First we check if the drop items parameter value is true. If so, we call the drop plant items function. Then we loop through all the possible positions for the plant blocks, and if there's root or section blocks, we set them to air blocks. This is baby function returns whether this plant is age zero. I wrote it thinking that I might have use for it often, but it was only used once. I keep it in case I have need for it later. This is a long one, the set plant age function. It starts with a check for if the plant has room to grow to the specified age. If so, we clear the current plant blocks with the for loop. Then an if else block for age 0, 1, and 2, or more. At age 0, there's only one root block. First we set the block at this location to this block, which is the root block at its default state. Then we get the tile entity for this block and check if it's an instance of tile entity banana plant. Then finally, we set the age for this tile entity to zero. At age one, the plant is two blocks high, a root block and a section block at tier two. We start by creating the root block. Then we retrieve the tile entity for it, and if it's a tile entity banana plant, we set its age to 1. Then we create the sections block, one block above the root block. And we repeat the same thing again for this block. We retrieve the tile entity for the sections block, one block above the root, and use the set age tier function to set the age to 1 and the tier to 2. And for the age 2 or more, the plant is 4 blocks high, a root block, and a sections block at tier 2, 3, and 4. We do the same thing for each one. We create them, then we retrieve the tile entity, and set their age and tier. This refresh state function checks if the plant's position is still a valid one. If not, it calls the kill plant function and returns true. This function will be used in the update to check if the plant should still be there. 
If the block under the root block is destroyed, for instance, the plant should be broken as well. This removed by player is an event function inherited from the block class. And it's called when the block is broken by a player. It simply calls the kill plant function to destroy the entire plant along with the root block. This get collision bounding box is another inherited function that returns a bounding box for entity collision. If the plant is a baby, meaning age zero, then we return null. A null collision bounding box will result in a block that the player and other entities can move through. Otherwise, we return the parent get collision bounding box. While testing this mod, I ran into a small problem. When a chunk is generated, sometimes a tree will be generated after the plants have been generated. I had a very hard time trying to figure out how I could force the plants to be generated after the trees, but couldn't find a way. The reason this was a problem is because when a tree is generated, it can sometimes create a leaf block intercepting one of the plant blocks without triggering a break event, which compromises the plant's block chain system we've created. So you can find some banana plants around the landscape that are missing blocks, replaced by leaf blocks. I fixed this problem by creating this function, which is called in the update. This kill if invalid function will check if there's any blocks missing in the stack that makes up the banana plant. And if there is, it calls the kill plant function to remove them as duds. It's definitely not as elegant of a solution as I would like, but it works. Forge has very few limitations, and you have to just find a way to work around them when they pop up. This sprout child nearby function is called in the update. First it checks if the light level is more than 15. And then generates a random number between 0 and 100. If the number is less than or equal to spawn child chance percentage, it then checks if the plant is age 7. If so, it randomly chooses a block within the spawn child max distance range. And if that position is an air block above a grass block, it spawns an age zero banana plant at that location. The age up function is also called on each update and is responsible for aging the plant. It first calls the refresh state function, which returns whether the plant is still valid, and destroys the plant if it's not. If the plant is still valid, it then retrieves the tile entity for this block and checks if the plant's age is less than 7. If so, it will then check if the current light level is higher than or equal to minimum light level to grow. 
If it is, a random number is generated and compared to the grow chance percentage. If the check passes, the set plant age function is called, passing the plant's current age plus one. In the else block, the plant is at its maximum age, and sprout child nearby is called. On neighbor block change is an event function inherited from the block class. It's called when a block adjacent to this block is changed. Here we call the parent on neighbor block change and the refresh state function. And the update kick, the main update event. Here we check if the world is not remote. Then we call the kill if invalid function and the age up function. This on block added is an override of an inherit event function. We'll keep it blank for now, but it will be used later. Now you can save and close this class. And open the block banana plant section class. We can start adding the custom functions. This kill self function simply sets this block to an air block. This find root block function returns the block pose of the root block of this plant. The drop plant items is required in this class for when the plant is destroyed by breaking a section block. The kill plant function does the same thing here as it does in the root block. It cycles through all the blocks of the plant and destroys them and calls the drop plant items if drop items parameter is true. Kill if invalid is called in the update and kills the plant if it becomes invalid. Kill plant is called if find root block returns null. If a section block can't find its root, or a root block can't find all its sections, the plant becomes invalid. Can be placed on returns whether the specified block is a root block or a section block. The set plant age function will find the root block, remove all the section blocks, and set the plant's age to the specified value. The update kick simply calls the kill if invalid. We set can harvest block to return false. Same with get item drop. 
and we override drop block as item with chance. And we set can place block at to return the parent can place block at and can place block on passing the block directly under this block as the parameter. We set is replaceable, is opaque cube, and is full cube to return false. We override on block harvested and harvest block because we'll be handling the item drops ourselves. The removed by player function simply calls the kill plant function. We also override the on block placed by event function. Next, we disable the block standard renderer by setting get render type to return negative one. This on block activated function is called when the player right clicks on the block. We start by retrieving the tile entity for this section block. If this block is age 7 and the tier that grows the fruit, which is tier 3 for the banana plant, we get a random amount between fruit min amount and fruit max amount. Then we set the plant's age to 4, and drop the random amount of bananas. The set block bounds based on state is used to set the bounding box for each tier at each age. And that's all for the sections class. You can save and close. Now we need to create the model classes for the plant. We actually need to create four model classes. The reason is that each model class can only have one texture size. And ages 0, 1, 2, and 3 to 7 have different texture sizes. If they didn't, we could cram all the models of the plant blocks into one model class. So we start by opening the Technif files for each block model and exporting them as Java files. I already exported them earlier. I organized all the model Java files in folders by age age 0, 1, 2, and 3 to 7 because the plant uses the same model for ages 3 to 7. In each folder, the models are named from tier 1 to tier 4. So let's start with the age 0 model class. Create a new class and call it model banana plant age 0. We extend it from the model base class.
We start with the model parts declarations. Each part of the model requires a model renderer object. I named each part by age, tier, and part number. The age 1 model, for example, is made of four parts. I named them age 0 tier 1 underscore and the part number. These four parts make up the age 0 root block. Now we add a constructor. First thing we need in the constructor is to define the texture size. Next, we can copy and paste the model definition into the constructor. and the set rotation and set rotation angles function. Now if you look closely, you'll see that the set rotation angles function is a little different. Techne doesn't add the entity parameter to this function, but it's required. And finally, a render function that sets the model's rotation and calls the render on each part of the model. The parameter for the render call is a rotation point modifier, which is usually set to a constant of 0 0.0625. And you can save and close this file. And now we simply create a model class for each age of the plant and repeat what we did in this one. The next one is the age one model. We call it model banana plant age one. Again, we extend it from the model base class. And we create a constructor for it. We set the texture size variables in the constructor. And a model renderer object for each part of the two block models. Note that I organized them by tier, age one, Tier 1 is made of only one block, and age 1 tier 2 is made of four blocks. Then in the constructor, we define them. I also organize the model definitions by tier and part number to keep things easy to read. the set rotation function,
and the set rotation angles function. And finally, the render function. In this render function, tier is added as a second parameter. For tier 1, we render the tier 1 block. And if tier equals 2, we render all the parts for the tier 2 block. And you can save and close. And we repeat again for the age 2 model. We extend from model base. Add a constructor. This plant age is made of four blocks, tier one to tier four. Tier one and tier two are made of one box each. Tier three is made of four boxes, and tier four is made of six boxes. We add the texture size variables. The tier 1 block model definition. the tier 2 block model definition, the tier 3 block model definition, and the tier 4 block model definition. the set rotation and set rotation angles functions, and the render function. If tier equals 1, we call the render function on the tier 1 block, and so on. And we can save and close this class. And now we create the final model class. This one covers age 3 to age 7, so we call it model banana plant age 3 7.
we declare the model renderers for all the parts of each block. Set the texture size variables. Define the tier 1 block, which is made of two boxes. The tier 2 block. The tier 3 block. and the Tier 4 block. The Set Rotation and Set Rotation Angles functions. and the render function. Then save and close. Now that we have all our models, let's open up the Tal Entity Banana Plant Renderer class. We start by declaring a private final object for each of our model classes. We name them age 0 to age 37 with an underscore model. And we initialize them in the constructor. Then we add a custom function called render now. The parameters are the tile entity banana plant and three doubles, x, y, and z. Then we call the bind texture function and pass a new resource location with the path to the banana plant texture. We use the get age function on the tile entity to retrieve the age number. If you've watched my MCP tutorials, I explain the basics of using a matrix in my turtle and monkey tutorials. Basically, a matrix is a local 3D stencil that we can use to translate, rotate, and scale a model, then render it to the screen. Matrix operations always start with a call to the OpenGL Manager's push matrix function, which prepares it for operations and pushes a new matrix onto the stack. Then we call the translate function and pass the x, y, z coordinates. We add 0.5 to the x and z coordinates to move the model to the center of the block. I also needed to add 1.5 to the y coordinate to move it up to the right height. Otherwise, the plant was partially inside the ground block. And finally, I had to rotate the model on the z axis 180 degrees for it to be properly oriented. After the rendering, the pop matrix function must be called to clear the matrix. Between the matrix operations and the pop matrix call, we place our render code. If the tier of the block we're rendering is 1, we check if the age of the plant is 0, 1, 2, or more.
If the block is not tier 1, we check if the age is 1, 2, or more, because tier 2 to 4 blocks don't exist in the age 0 plan. In the tier 1 age 0 block, we call render on the age 0 model and pass null as the entity and 1 as the tier parameter. In the tier 1 age 1, we call the render on the age 1 model and pass 1 as the tier parameter. And we do the same for the age 2 and age 3 to 7 models. In the else block, we do the same thing for the age 1, 2, and 3 to 7, but we call the get tier for the tier parameter on each one. The render tile entity at function is the render event called on this tile entity each tick. In here, we check if the tile entity passed in is an instance of tile entity banana plant. If so, we call the render now function we just created and cast the tile entity to tile entity banana plant for the first parameter. And that's all. You can save and close. And open the main class. Add a static block banana plant root called banana plant. Then save and close. And open the common proxy class. We initialize the banana plant object with the following parameters. Null for the fruit parameter, because we haven't created the banana item yet. We'll get to that in a moment. 3 for the fruit fall height, because the banana grows on the tier 3 block. 1 and 5 for the minimum and maximum fruit amount. 2 for both the plant hardness and plant resistance. 12 for the minimum grow light level. 10 for the grow chance percentage, 30 for the update tick interval, 40 and 100 for the minimum and maximum gen height, 5 for the max gen amount per chunk, 10 for the gen chance percentage, 3 for the spawn child chance percentage, and 1 for the spawn child max distance. We leave the gem biome null since we haven't created a world generator yet. Feel free to play around with these values to get the results you want. However, some of these values won't do anything yet until we create a world generator. And we can save and close the common proxy class. Open the client proxy class. In the init function, we register the banana plant item renderer with the register renderer function we created in the block banana plant root class. And that's it. You can save and close the client proxy. Now before we get to the assets, let's quickly add the banana item. Open the main class again. And add a new static item food object called banana.
Save that and open the common proxy class. We'll initialize the banana item with the parameters 3 for the food amount and 0 0.3 for the saturation and false for whether the wolf can eat this food. We set its unlocalized name to banana and register it. Now we can add it to the first parameter of the banana plant as the fruit item. Then save this class and open the client proxy. Here we register the banana item renderer. Then save and close Eclipse. It's time to get all our assets into the resource folder. Here I've organized all the assets into their respective folders. The block states for the banana plant and banana plant section. These two files are actually identical. They both call on the banana plant JSON model. Now you may be asking, but Kevin, we're not using the standard JSON model system to render our blocks. We're using the tile entity renderer. Why do we need block state and JSON model files? That's true, but the Minecraft engine still requires these files for each registered block. The only thing that will be used in the model files is the texture for the particles. And if you leave these files out, the tile entity won't render because the engine won't recognize them as valid blocks. So the block states and JSON model files are required for all blocks regardless of whether you're using them or not. So in the models block folder, we have the banana plant model that our block state files call on. You'll notice that we use the banana plant particles texture in the JSON model. Like I said, when we break one of our tile entity blocks, the particles that spawn are still generated from the JSON model files. So we want this particles texture to be used. And in the model's item folder, we have our banana item model and banana plant item model. These are just standard generated item models that drop and get picked up. In the textures blocks folder, we have all our banana plant textures, including the banana plant particles texture. This is the particles texture. And in the textures items folder, we have the texture for the banana 
and the banana plant item. And finally, in the Lang folder, we have the Lang file that contains the in-game names for our items. Now let's get these copied into our Forge resource folder. Open your Forge folder and navigate to the Source Main Resource folder. In here, we need to create an assets folder. And in the assets folder, we need to create another folder named the same as your mod ID. And we can simply copy all our assets folders into this folder. Then start up Eclipse again. And there's all our assets in the resource folder in the Package Explorer. Now let's hit the Run button and test out our banana plant.
And that's all for now. I think this was my longest video yet. So to recap, we've learned how to bypass the JSON model system and use tile entities to render Technium models as blocks. And we also learned how to use tile entities to save and load persistent custom data for those blocks. In the next tutorial, we'll be creating a simple world generator for this plant. I'll show you how to hook into the Forge event bus, which I think is a really nice feature of Forge, to access the populate and decorate events. As usual, you can download the source and assets for this project in the description below. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Uh, please remember to hit that like button and feel free to share and subscribe for more. See you soon.